Yeah, the, the Fortress thing on the Wikipedia page is actually not, not true. We were not particularly influenced by Fortress since none of us have ever programmed in Fortress. Um, but it, it does bear a lot of similarities, but I think it's convergent evolution. Um, so I'm going to talk about what's new and exciting in Julia. Two years ago, I came here and gave a talk about uh, multiple dispatch and the sort of the, the benefits, but also the, at, at the responsibilities that came with multiple dispatch. Uh, Julia's main paradigm is multiple dispatch. So you write, uh, you have generic functions, which you can write many signatures to. Uh, and the particular implementation of a function that's chosen uh, dynamically depends on the types of all of its arguments. Um, that has a really nice property that it, it sort of, it reifies the concept uh, that is like just a method name in object-oriented programming. It also takes uh, method function, generic functions outside of types, which is really nice. It allows you to share types between different, uh, between different bodies of code much more smoothly than you can in object-oriented programming, where everybody basically has to agree on the functions that a, a type hierarchy is gonna, is gonna implement, whereas this way you, you don't have to do that. Uh, but I'm not going to talk so much about that today, unless people really want me to. Uh, I'm going to talk about some of the new and exciting features that we've got in the, the recently released uh, Julia 0.4, uh, and some of the stuff that we've got cooking uh, for the next release of Julia. Um, so that's my one and only slide. The rest of it's actually going to be all live code um, with all the, all the potential for uh, failure and excitement that that can bring. All right, so um, I'm, I'm going to use the, uh, the, the Jupyter Notebook, which is this uh, wonderful didactic tool that was originally created for Python by uh, Fernando Perez. Uh, he wanted something that was like Mathematica notebooks, but not Mathematica and you know, open source. Um, but it sort of, it, you know, it, it, it spiraled beyond that. Uh, and now it is this multi-language uh, web front end that lets you mix text and code and evaluate code and do nice typesetting. Um, and then you can publish those on the web because the nice thing about it is that it's self-contained and you can include graphics and the output of, of the code that you evaluated in it as well. Um, so this is a Jupyter Notebook running with a, a Julia kernel backend. Um, and so the first thing I'm gonna do, just to give you a flavor of the language, because I feel like you really gotta get a sense of it. So if, has anybody in here, you know, who's programmed in Julia a little bit? Oh, okay, that's a, that's a respectable number, okay. Um, so this is, you know, this is going to, this has nothing to do with the name of the programming language, but this is going to compute uh, the Julia set. Uh, and so the Julia set is this famous fractal. Um, and what you do is you do this, this complex number iteration where you take, you know, two complex numbers, Z and C, uh, and you do this iteration thing uh, for a while. Um, you know, Z equals Z squared plus C. Uh, and, and as soon as uh, the absolute value of z is greater than 2, or the squared of the absolute value of z is greater than 4, it's a more efficient way to compute it, uh, then you return, and that's the number of iterations it took to escape. Uh, and then you can plot the, the, the time it took to escape, and you get these pretty pictures, and we're going to see some of those. Um, so Julia is dynamic. It's an interactive language. You can you know, just type your code in and do, evaluate it. Um, we can see here that the, you know, we can, we're evaluating it one pair of complex points, um, but you know you can do different points. So you can see that as we as we take the imaginary part of this higher, we get significantly higher numbers, and then you know at some point we get even bigger. I think I don't know. I don't know. There's there's you know it goes up to like a hundred because a hundred is the max that we allowed. Um, and so we can actually see this evaluated at a bunch of points using an array comprehension. This is probably familiar notation to people from, you know, uh, from Python. Other languages have similar constructs. Um, you know, that, let me see. Yeah, okay. The formatting is a little, it need, needs to be a little bit smaller. So you can see that uh, the, the upper left hand and lower right hand side parts of this, this array are uninteresting. They're all twos. And then there's some interesting stuff going on in the other corners. Um, but this is a terrible way to visualize this. This is not what we want to see. Um, but one thing we can see that's kind of interesting is that we can see how this is getting computed. And this is one of the things that makes Julie interesting uh, for numerical computing uh, is that we, we just in time compile it and we generate pretty efficient code. So even though you didn't mention any types in there, um, 
we look at the types you actually call the function on, and we generate code specifically for that, and generally we can infer concrete types for things and generate the same code that like a C compiler would. Um, so you can see here these are x86 vector instructions, and it's a pretty small tight loop, and this is the entire thing. This is going to be pretty fast. Um, uh, so I'm going to load a couple of packages, colors, image, and images, and image magic. Uh, and then I'm going to define a color map. And the color map is going to be this. You can see it. One of the nice features of this iJulia interface is that you can define display methods for different types of objects, and they can display themselves in nice, convenient ways. Like, this is actually just an array of RGB values. But it knows that you should display it for an array of RGB values as this like, nice color swatch. Um, and then, you know, using that color swatch, what we can do is we can basically just, you know, compute that same thing that we computed up here, um, that array, but use each value and index into the color map, and then we're going to have an array of color values instead. So we can actually see that without the image part. So, actually, so let's do it without that bit. Oops. Okay, so this is the, what did I do here? Okay, uh, so this is actually a bigger square and the, the corners are even more uninteresting. Um, but we can index into that with CMAP. Uh, so we can use, use each value to index into the CMAP. And the CMAP has got 100 values from zero, from one, zero to 100. Um, And we'll get a big array of these color values. Oh, no, no this is, I should not have done this. Um, there we go. It, it's going to display it as a really big image. You actually want to wrap it in the image thing because the image displays much more nicely. So we'll see that now. Hopefully I regain control of the browser. There we go. Okay, so that's a, that's a much nicer size. Um, so that one of the interesting things about the, uh, about the Julia set is that if you change these parameters, so what I did here is I evaluated it uh, for a, a, I changed the first parameter across a like, grid of different uh, complex points, uh, and I kept the second parameter fixed. Uh, and this is the pattern we get for the escape values. Um, but you know, if you change this value just a little bit, you get rather different patterns. Uh, and they're all quite beautiful, and they're, they're sort of, you know, they're, they're really interesting to explore. Um, Interestingly also, uh, you know, people, if people are familiar with the Mandelbrot set, the Mandelbrot set is actually the diagonal of this space. So if you change those so that they're both the same, then you get, you get the classic Mandelbrot set. Um, anyway, I, this is, you know, it's nice to look at the pretty pictures and sort of tweak the numbers, but we can do much better than that. Uh, so we can use this thing called Interact, which is actually a functional reactive programming package uh, written in Julia. Um, that gives you these widgets. So it turns you know, your computation into something with signals and inputs, and then it gives you slider widgets, uh, and you can do stuff like this. And you can ch see how, the, how the, the fractal changes as you slide these things. Um, yeah, that one changes it. The, the imaginary part changes it quite radically. The real part changes it a little bit more slowly. And we can sort of, I don't know, we can see all sorts of interesting things happening here. Um, it's a little laggy, though. Uh, and so what I did, uh, this, is, this is going to allocate a new array and construct a new array every single time. And we know that you know, allocation is not that fast. It would be much better to just use the same array and then write into it. So this is one of the things that Julia excels at. Um, you can write this like, nice sort of functional, high-level approach. But without too much more fuss, you can actually write the version that you know, is equivalent to what C is doing, where you pre-allocate something and then update the, the, the data in it. So what I'm going to do here is I'm just going to use let to get a couple of local variables so that I can ask for their length and stuff. Um, just sort of makes the code a little nicer. So what I do here is I pre-allocate a data array, which is an array of RGB uh, uint 8 values um, of the appropriate size. And then I construct an image ob object of that data. And then I have this manipulate instruction that's going to go through and go, th you know, look at all the pairs um, and do the CMAP thing and assign that right into the data array, mutate that, and then just at the end return the image. I don't have to do anything more with the image because I'm actually just changing the data in place. So if I just redisplay the same image, it'll be fine. And this does no allocation. Um, and so what you can see is that it is, you know, it's it's some it's it's less laggy basically. So it's a little bit faster. Um, I have a pretty, pretty 
a weak laptop, so on a, on a beefier machine, this would actually be, this would fly. Um, okay. So I think that gives a little bit of a sense of the language. Does anybody have any questions about this? Okay. All right. So, you know, Julia said, I feel like that's a good, good starting point. Um, so that's enough intro material. Now I'm going to talk about some of the features that we've added. Um, Actually, a lot of the stuff that I'm demoing here, like the, the manipulate stuff, it's, while it's not features of the language, it's like libraries that were developed relatively recently. So they're, um, although manipulate's been around for like at least six months. It was uh, the product of a Google Summer of Code project last summer that was very successful. Um, so this is probably the least exciting new feature, but it actually is, like, makes a huge difference for people's experience, doc strings. So, Doc strings, if you're familiar with doc strings from like, you know, Python or Clojure, uh, basically they look like this. You put a string, uh, in Python you put it inside of the function, but because we have uh, multiple methods, so you might do something like frob foo bar uh, equals, I don't know, I don't know, foo to the bar, I don't know, it doesn't make any sense, but whatever. Um, now you can ask about frob, and you can see that it gets that string. Um, so because we have these one-liner definitions, it makes sense to put the doc string ahead, uh, and also because you tend to have lots of met little method definitions. It just seemed better that way. Um, so just in, in evaluating this code, I now immediately got help for frob. Um, that's really nice because now as soon as you load a package like the colors package, you can ask about colors and you immediately get the readme and you can look at it and you'll be like, oh, okay, well, there's something called RGB in this colors package, so maybe I wanna know more about that and you can see that RGB is the standard red, green, blue, sRGB color space, yada, yada, yada. Um, so this makes you know, learning about the thing that you're trying to use a lot more con convenient. Um, I don't know why I put this up top, but I like this uh, particular bit of help because it has inline LaTeX which is kind of cool, and it renders correctly in the, in the, in the Jupyter Notebook. Um, so, you know, you can read about FFTs in style. Um, so that's doc strings. It's, uh, it, it's, not, it's not that exciting, but I think it actually makes a huge difference in terms of people's day-to-day people's -day life. Um, so function call overloading. Uh, in Julia 0.3, there were certain types that were callable. Um, so the way you would construct an object uh, is you would do something like this. So you have this add n functor type. It's an immutable type, uh, which means that once you've constructed one of these guys, you can't change the field n. Um, it has a type parameter t, which is a number. Uh, the reason to do that is actually so that you, get a, you actually get a different type for every type of argument you might pass it, and that allows you to do better code generation. Um, it's a little, little bit more, you know, it's a little bit subtle. Um, you know, otherwise, you could just insist that this be like an int or a float or some, something like that, but then you wouldn't, you wouldn't, get, you wouldn't get good type information about it. Um, so by default, you could previously write add n functor of two. That would have worked. So for this type, you could have, you could have done call, you could have called the type on something. Um, Oh, whoops, let me restart this kernel. Uh, there we go. Um, takes a second to start the kernel. Okay, so I've defined this new type, um, and I can immediately create, uh, this, is, this is a type where it, you, know, you give it some n, uh, and it's supposed to behave like a function that adds that n to whatever thing you call it on. Um, Obviously, you could just use a closure for this, but you know we're gonna we're gonna make a type that does the same thing instead. Um, and so you can construct one of these, and this is what we would like to have work. But by default, it does not work because the thing is not actually a function; it's a, it's just an object. Um, and here's what you can do now uh, as a, a new feature: you can write call, and then so call is now a generic function, which is the generic function that the the call syntax f of x boils down to. It actually boils down to doing this. So you can overload it and you can say, well, if, uh, if the thing you're calling, if f is an add n functor object and you're calling it on some x, uh, then you know, actually what I would like you to do is say x plus f of n, the, the, the field inside. So we've defined that and now this thing actually works. It does the thing that it's supposed to do. Um, and of course, in classic Julia style, you can see the native code and it's efficient. It does, you know, the abstraction has zero cost. Um, you still can't do, for example, things like, 
uh, you know, f of 3 comma 4, um, oh, whoops, that was just the, the bound name, uh, add 2 of 3 comma 4, because we didn't define a method for multiple arguments, we only did it for one argument. Okay, so why, why do we want this? I mean, this is kind of cute. It's cute that you can call things that aren't functions, but wouldn't it be better to just only call things that are functions as functions? That's actually what we thought at first. Jeff was very against having anything but functions be callable, but then he came around. Um, so one of the nice things is that, you know, we, so we were already doing this type constructor thing. So this, this worked previously in, in, in 0.3. But then you end up in this sort of sticky situation where you're trying to explain to people why some types are callable and some types aren't. Um, and it just, you know, it was, it was an ugly situation. So now, if you want to construct something of some type or convert to that type, all you do is you use the same, the same syntax. And you say, OK, I got 1, 2, 3, and I want to turn it into a float 64. I just say float 64 of that. Previously, we had to do this. We had to do float 64 of 1, 2, 3, which is kind of ugly. Um, same thing for int, you know, it works for all sorts of things. Um, another thing that's really handy, so, you know, we have pr very good uh, uh, Python integration. Um, so this package called PyCall lets you totally transparently call back and forth between Python and Julia. You can even pass, you know, function objects and callbacks back and forth, which is pretty sweet. So here, for example, I, f is going to be a Python lambda object. So you can see it's a pi object that is a function that is a lambda, and it's got the, some address in there. Um, and the PyCall uh, library can now overload that object to allow it to call stuff. So we can actually just write f of 2 comma 3, and it acts like a function, even though the type of this thing is pi object. So obviously, this is a much nicer experience than having to like do some other thing that's like, you know, not actually a function call. Um, now here's where it gets into the interesting mathy stuff. Um, so one thing that we've observed is that people in functional programming are very into function types. Um, and people in numerical programming are weirdly not into function types. And the reason is because almost all of our functions are just float, like float to float. So it's like totally uninteresting. I'm like, all right, yeah, I got another function that's float to float. Um, but there are really, other really interesting things about your functions. So this, we, we have, instead of just, you know, worrying about the, like, the literal, like, what are the types this thing maps between, because they're usually just not that interesting to us, um, we can do nominal typing of functions. Uh, and so this is, this is an example of that. Uh, so you, essentially what you do is instead of, you know, you, you, you have objects which represent your function and implement it by overloading call, um, but which have additional type information which you can then dispatch on and do cool things with. Uh, and this allows you to do things that, that sort of map onto your problem domain rather than mapping onto like, you know, the types that you happen to be mapping between on the computer. Uh, so this is uh, an, an example uh, where you, you're, you know, working with boundary element methods and you have these, you know, kernel functions, some of which are more or less complicated. Um, so for example, you know, a, the most general thing is just some abstract kernel. You don't really know anything about it. It has no real structure. Um, but, you know, a power law has, you know, decays as x to the p for, you know, x way le much less than s and as x to the q for x greater than s. Um, and so the things that are interesting about that are not the thing, the fact that it maps floats to floats. It's the fact that this p, q, and s are what describe it. So we have this type now that captures that information. Uh, and then you can have, you know, a, a, a concrete power law type that actually implements that and actually has no, no fields. Um, and you just define that. Uh, and so, you know, here's an example where we define this kernel that is defined by this integral. Um, and you can see that this has got this, you know, you've got nice, nice straightforward notation for this. Uh, oops, I can't redefine it. Um, but I can define an instance of it, and then I can actually call that instance. Uh, and of course, you know, the LLVM code is just two instructions. The native code is going to be, you know, comparably easy. Um, okay. Uh, I am going to come back to this example. Someone please remind me if I forget. Uh, after I explain staged functions, which I am about to do. That's the next topic. Um, okay. 
All right, so. Uh, actually, we, we ended up calling them generated functions because they're just a form of, ge of code generation. Um, okay, is that visible to everybody? Yeah, it seems pretty good. Okay, um, so there's different forms of staged code generation, right? So JIT is one example. You know, you're, instead of doing your compilation all up at, at, up at once, you wait until the very last minute to generate code. Um, other examples are macros, right? So you, do, you take an input expression and you run code on that input expression and turn it into a different expression, and then that is actually what Ex what executes in place of, of the macro that, you know, invocation. Um, those are interesting. We found this other one that kind of fits nicely in between and like fits very well with the way Julio does stuff, uh, which we're calling generated functions. And essentially what it is is that we're hooking in right after type inference and right before code generation. So you've, 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 sent, you've, you've got a function and you've inferred the types, so you know what the argument types are. Um, but then, it, normally what you would do is you would say, okay, well, I've figured out the argument types and I have this AST that's, that's type annotated, and I'm gonna turn that into machine code, which I'm then gonna run. Uh, what we do instead is we say, okay, well, we, we're gonna run code, which is going to generate the code that you actually run. Sounds crazy, I'm gonna give you an example and hopefully it'll become clearer. Um, so, Oh, maybe I should have made this smaller. When your function doesn't fit in the screen, it's not good. All right. There we go, okay, now it fits. Um, okay, uh, so the only difference between this syntactically uh, and a normal function is the at generated macro at the beginning, which is just a sort of, it, it tells the, the, the system like to do the generated thing for this. Um, so now, what it does, what it, the way it works differently is that when this body of code runs, instead of A being an array, an actual array object, A is actually the type of the array. And what this code is supposed to do is it's supposed to generate an AST that is the body that, of the code that's actually going to execute. And then that is compiled and run, and that is what actually happens. Um, and so the reason you want to do this, I'll, I'll run it and you can see what happens. So end loops uh, ran to, well, so end loops ran to, we'll go through and print the two random numbers in this very small array. Uh, ran two three is a, a two by three uh, matrix uh, and it'll print all the coordinates and their values. Uh, ran two three four, we'll do the same thing. Okay, so now you might ask yourself, why, why would you need this generated code, code thing here? Well, what is the most efficient way to go through and print all of the things in a multi-dimensional array? Anybody? Like, how would you do it? You have a three-dimensional array. How do you iterate through all of the things and print their indices and print their values? Yeah, three nested loops, right? Um, and for a two-dimensional array, it's two nested loops. And for a one-dimensional array, it's one nested loop. So the thing is the number of loop nests that you want to, for the optimal code depends on the type of the argument. And so that's what this is useful for. Um, and actually we can see, if we just look at this definition and we change it to a normal function and change the name uh, and change this to a singleton kind we can actually call it on the types of these guys. Uh, and you can see that this thing, the code that this generates is this, it's an AST. This is just an, a Julia expression that we've generated at runtime um, with one for loop, which does the completely natural thing. It goes I equal, I1 equals one through size of A, uh, and then it prints, you know, a comma i, and then the actual a value there. Um, but if we do two dimensions, it's two nested for loops. And if we do 
three dimensions, it's three nested for loops. And if we do six dimensions, it's six nested for loops. So this is like I, this is a real pain to do. This simplified a ton of our multi-dimensional array code, and also a bunch of other cool stuff that like got got really simplified. Um, I, I don't know of any like this exact feature in any other language, but uh, but we've we've been enjoying this. Um, the only thing is it, it plays very badly with uh, pre-compilation. So we're also simultaneously working on static pre-compilation of programs, and this is like you can't like how do you how do you you pre-compile this, you have to run code, and you don't, you know, you have to have the runtime system in order to execute this code when you encounter it. The thing that's nice about this, too, is that unlike macros, which have these totally different evaluation sem semantics, um, you know, you can do map end loops over, you know, ran two, three, uh, ran two, Oh my god, I can't type. Um, right, you can you can map it over stuff. That's totally reasonable to do. Uh, it's just it behaves exactly like a normal function, and from the user's perspective, it is just a normal function. It's just that the compile you get to like run code when you when when deciding what the actual body is, you get to run code. Um, so that that's pretty cool. Um, so back to that example at the end here. Uh, so this is an example where you're using generated functions uh, with these, these pa this power law example. Um, and, and this is a real example. Like This is actually uh, something that people need to do, and it's like a nightmare to do in other systems. Uh, the call, so you overload the call method for this power law type, this integral thing. And what you do is when you're generating the code to run, you, 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 you solve an integral. You compute the Chebyshev coefficients with this fairly expensive integral. And then you actually generate code that has those constants in line so the code that you generate is efficient. This works and it's like, it's blazingly fast and much faster than anything else. And like you can't, I mean, I don't know how you would do this with like C++ libraries or something. It's just like not really feasible. Um, and that, that's actually one of the reasons why these boundary element methods, there aren't good libraries for them because this is the kind of crazy thing you need to do. There's this like weird staging of programming that needs to happen. Um, so anyway, I, I, this, this is just kind of a fun example. Also note the like uh, Unicode variable names. That's always fun. Um, okay. Uh, so that is, I think that is, what I'm talking about for, yep, that was all the new features. So now we're gonna get into the experimental stuff where it gets weird. Um, it's not that weird actually, but it's experimental. So this is where things might get crashy. I spent a long time compiling special versions of LLVM to make the, these parts of the demo work. Um, okay. Okay, so the first thing I'm going to demo is uh, this system called CXX, which is, uh, CXX is actually a really slick uh, C++ binding library. So, so you just say using CXX and then you wait for an eternity because it's compiling all of Clang basically. Um, no, it does use Clang and it does generate a lot of code that it has to compile when it does this, but it's not all of Clang, although it is using all of Clang. It's like loading lib Clang in memory. Because uh, as it turns out, to interoperate with C++, you basically need a C++ compiler. There's not really anything else you can do. It's not like C, where there's a nice API. Um, and what this lets you do is it lets you write inline C++ code um, and then pass functions and values back and forth between Julia and C++. Um, so for example, uh, you can do something like this, CXX. Um, Double F. I, I keep wanting to type function at the beginning and then type like end is the keyword. I'm like, I've done way too much non curly brace programming for a long time now. Um, so I don't know, we can do something pretty simple with this. Uh, return uh, two times X times Y. Uh, 
plus x minus y, something like that. I don't know. Uh, OK. Um, so that didn't give us anything. It just evaluated some C++ code. But what we can do is we can use this CXX macro um, to call it. And now JIT is happening again. Um, and you see you get the value 11. Uh, you know, 3.5, you get different values for different things. Um, and the other thing you can do is, so let's say you, you, know, you wanted to wrap this. So let's say I'd like to have, you know, currently I don't have anything called F in Julia space. I just have something called F in C++ space. Um, so I'd like to do that. Uh, and now I can do that, and it's calling the C++ code. Um, and you can see that what's happening is that uh, it doesn't, you know, so for this particular invocation, we know the signature of the C++ code. We know that it takes two doubles. Uh, so it has to do a signed integer to a floating point conversion of, one, of the first argument first, because that one was an integer and the other one was already a double, so that's fine. Um, and then you just call this thing, and it's you know, got some mangled name in there, um, as C++ functions are wont to be. Uh, and then it returns that, that result. Um, and you can see that you know, if I pass it to two doubles, then all I got to do is just like, you know, straight up call the Call the, call the C++ function. Here I have to convert both of them. Uh, so it, it knows how to do all of these things. Um, let's, uh, let's see some other examples. Um, so that was basically C code. So let's see something that's actually got a class in it. Um, I, yeah, here we go. Here's an example I typed in earlier. I couldn't, I, I couldn't really remember all of this syntax. So um, you'll have to forgive me when I just recall it from the history. Um, so I kind of I kind of messed up the uh, the indentation here, but I think it doesn't really it doesn't really matter. It's not Python. Um, so yeah, anyway, so this defines a hello class which you know says hello world and tells you the time. Um, and we we just define it. Um, and then we can get a reference in Julia land to the hello class or uh, you know an instantiation of the hello class. Um, yeah, what did I do? Ah, oh, there's something. Yeah. Somewhere up here in my history, there is the, the way to call this. Ah, there it is, timestamp. OK, so I generate a timestamp as a, as a, a Julia date object. Um, or actually, it, it turned it into a string. And then it passes it to the hello world, uh, the hello, hello class object, and then it prints its thing. So this is pretty seamless integration between Julia and C++, which I kind of like never thought I would see, but Keno is a mad genius and he made this all happen. I think he's a little too in love with C++. It worries me sometimes. Um, but I can't complain about having great C++ interop, so it's, it's all, all for the best. Um, okay, so any questions about this? Uh, oh, oh there, is, there is one other thing which is a little bit crazy. I, I don't know if I should even demo it. Um, I, I'm a little worried that I'm not going to get it right, but we'll see. Let's see how this goes. Um, all right, let's let's see what we can do here. All right, so um, I'm going to do a different function just to keep it simple. I'm not going to try to change that one. Uh, void. Okay, so I'm going to do, I probably should have prepared this beforehand, but I'm just going to do it by the seat of my pants. Um, so what this is going to do is 
is it's going to displace a Julia, not a value, but an expression. Because these are both compiled by LLVM. So we can generate LLVM expressions for Julia code and then splice it into the LLVM code for the C++ code and then generate code for that whole thing together. This is like so dastardly. I don't know if this is going to work. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I got to tell it that it's a nothing. Oh, no, no, I need to tell it that. Uh, uh, I'm not going to get this right. Anyway, you can do this. I, I can actually, there's, a, there's an example from the, from the, from the web page for this. Um, I have it up here. Um, where does he do this? Ah, uh, here's the example. That's it. Okay, so test Julia print should do it. Yeah, yeah, we changed the name, I know. Okay, so CX, CXX, test. Test Julia print. Um, and so that, that's what this is doing. It's actually calling the Julia print line inside of the C, the C++ function body, which is madness. By, by injecting LLVM. By injecting LLVM. I know, it's ridiculous. Um, uh, so so, so the, the, use, the use case for doing this, uh, which I think is actually like a questionable motivation, in my opinion, was to write the next thing that I'm about to demo, which is a debugger which uses LLDB, which is a, you know, LLVM's uh, debugger library, which is in C++. Uh, so Keno wanted to be able to call LLDB very easily. And so, you know, in the most ep epic yak shave of all time, he wrote this C++, these C++ bindings in order to be able to call LLDB. Um, yeah, so, you know, there you have it. So I'm gonna demo the debugger next. Um, Five minutes, okay. All right. Um, okay, so uh, should I do the debugger or should I do threading if I only have five minutes? I'm gonna do threading and then I'll come back to the debugger if, if need be. Okay, so I gotta go back to this one because this, this is the version of Julia with the threading. Um, Okay, so we're going to, okay, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna define this Julia set thing, um, which computes the same exact Julia set that we did in the beginning. Um, except it does it uh, it does it by pre-allocating an array because we don't support the our threading like stuff is pretty preliminary so the threading works but the API is very much not what it's going to be um, so the only thing one of the only things it supports is parallel for loops for the moment so this Julia set function is going to compute the Julia set as before, but instead of using the nice comprehension syntax that makes it a one-liner, I'm gonna pre-allocate an array and then actually like do the for loops and go through and fill it in. But it's doing the exact same thing. Um, and so you can call this Julia set thing. Um, man, my... My command line foo today is kind of crappy. Um, actually, I said. All right. Uh, there we 
go. Okay. So I'm going to call this guy here. Uh, that seems like a good one. We'll do that. Uh, oh, I'm in the wrong window. Oh God, I've confused myself terribly now. Um, all right. Okay. Oh, I have to define the actual Julia function, sorry. That was in a different session. Okay. Max iter equals 100. All right. Okay, we can see that that actually works now. Uh, and I'm going to call this guy. Computes the Julia set. Sorry, that took a little longer than expected. Um, well, let's time it and see how long it takes. Okay, 4.6 seconds. Time it again. I don't know. It takes, yeah, it's around 0.5 seconds. Okay, can we do any better? Uh, well, threading would seem to be some, a good way to do this better. Um, so all you need to do to make this threaded is, well, change the name, but that actually isn't necessary. Um, write threads all, and it does you know, parallel, parallel OpenMP open style threading ac across all of the outer for loop. And that should be good enough to get us a little bit more of a speed up. Um, this is a wimpy machine, so we can't expect much. I only have two cores. Um, oh, sorry, I have to do using threads. Yeah, it's, it's not, not available by default. You still have to do using. Um, okay, so now, yeah, and you see it's about twice as fast, which is as good as it's gonna get on a two core machine. Um, I could demo it on a machine with more cores, but you know, that's a little bit iffy. Um, should I try it? Should we go ahead and, nah, I don't have time. Okay. Um, Cool, we also have a debugger, uh, but I don't have time for that either. Uh, but anyway, thank you. Okay, do I have time for a question or? Not really. Well, okay. um, I think I can show enough here to say maybe one question is very short. All right, sure. Yes, I mean, that's the whole point, is to call C++ libraries, yeah. Yeah, it's not just to write C++ code in line, um, but it does, it does have that effect. Uh, you can also do that. Um. All right, cool, thank you very much.